Welcome to Casual Friday. So a few things to talk about today. I want to give an update on the August sock knit along. I want to share with you a finished object that I knit just this week. I want to talk about my next vintage sweater project. And then I'm going to answer a question about yarn labels. So if you want to jump from one point to the other in the video, there are links down in the video description. The August sock knit along officially begins August 1st, but really you don't have to start on August 1st if you don't want to or you don't have time. The pattern, which is really a reference materials documentation that I'm creating for the knit along, um, will be available going forward at any time. So you could always purchase the pattern off of Ravelry. Um, and again, I say pattern, meaning you, you purchase it as if it were a pattern. It's really guidelines for how to produce a pair of socks that fit you well. So from the starting point of measuring to figuring out how, where your fit issues might be um, to selecting different components of your sock and then modifying those components based on your fit issues, if you have any. So the knit along is really, everybody is going to be knitting their own version of their sock that they're creating for themselves. They're all gonna be knitting it at the same time. And we officially begin on August 1st. So far, I've released the first three parts of the documentation. The fourth one will come out this weekend. Part three um, got split into two parts because it's so large. It's about heels. And so I split it up into a whole document just about heel flaps and heel turns and making modifications depending on what stitch patterns and what sorts of heel turn you wanna use. And part four will be about peasant heels and short row heels because they have very similar fit issues for, for some people. The final part will be on toes and a variety of toes that you can use for for your sock and that one probably won't be released until after the, the, the knit along officially begins. But since it's the last thing that you'll be knitting on your sock, you don't really have to make decisions about how you're going to knit your toe until you are well into your foot. So if you're interested in the knit along materials, I will put a link down in the video description. Again, it's a Ravelry pattern purchase and in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks, is where the knit along discussion goes. If you are not on Ravelry, there's no other way to purchase the pattern, but I do have more than five hours worth of, of sock technique videos on my channel. If you are here on YouTube and you look below the playback screen, you should see a, a little choices for for videos or playlists and other things. And if you click on playlists, you can see all of my playlists on my channel. Every video that I upload goes into at least one of those playlists. And the one on socks is, is, has got tons of hours and hours of information about how different components of a sock work and how you can modify those for your own purposes. But again, there's no other way to get the pattern and there's no other way to participate in the discussion if you aren't on Ravelry. Last weekend, I got a calendar alert reminding me that tomorrow is a surprise birthday party for a friend of mine. And I've made her socks before, so I have all of her measurements. It's one of the great things about keeping a file folder of, of people's foot tracings and all of their measurements is that once I have that, I always have that. And I can choose to knit a pair of socks for somebody as a surprise. And I happen to know she really loved the socks that I knit for her previously. So I thought I would crank out a pair of socks for her this week in time for her birthday party tomorrow. So I still have to wash these and weave in the ends but here are the socks. And one of the things that you might notice is that these socks match. And this is a self-striping sock yarn. It's the sort of yarn that I prefer to use when I knit socks. I like knitting a plain sock, but with self-striping yarn because I find it interesting, it's compelling, it keeps me knitting to see how the colorway is going to play out. What I wanted to talk about was how I knit socks to make sure that they match. In most cases, if you want to knit self-striping socks, you have to knit them one at a time. You don't always have to. There are some cases in which you can divide your, your ball of sock yarn into two and knit two at a time, but 
for complex uh, striping patterns, it's almost impossible to do that. So I wanna show you sort of the process of how I begin the first sock so that I can then use that same technique when I'm knitting the second sock. My first step when I approach knitting a pair of socks with self-striping yarn is that I want my socks to match each other if I can. So some striping patterns are very easy to match and some are more challenging. So I'm gonna kind of take you through the steps that I go through when I am going to start a pair of socks. So the first thing I do is I check the yarn label to see if there's a photo of the colorway on um, the label somewhere. Not all yarn companies do this, but some of them do. And it can be really helpful to see what the striping pattern is gonna, how it's gonna play out. Because you can't tell by looking at this ball of yarn how this is going to stripe. So for this ball of yarn, this is online yarn, you can see that there's a photo here. This one is called Super Sock 100 Harlequin Color. So this is a line that they have, a, a sort of a, a, a grouping of colorways that are very related to each other. They have different colors in each colorway, but they stripe in the same way. This photo has shows eight different colorways. So you can see all of the colorways that they offer and then you can compare that to the one you have here. So I think that this one is probably this one right here with the purple stripes that pop out. I don't see another one that looks like it's, it's probable. But now I can kind of see how that striping pattern works out. Even though they're kind of crazy stripes, it's very regular. You have the purple one and then you have this sequence of kind of orangey white color. So it's a fairly short repeat. So this next one is a Regia design line. So Regia has some uh, knitwear designers design colorways for them. And in this case, this one was designed by Kaif Bassett. And he, he's an artist, in, when I learned to knit in the 80s, he was huge with his books on color and, and blend, using um, mixing colors together with you know, different yarns. And what you'll see here is a picture of a, of a sock where it's, kind, it's striping, but they're not regular stripes by any means. And you can see that the colors maybe repeat within that. And you also see that it doesn't match the colors that you see here. So what they've done here is like the online sock yarn had eight different colorways within their Harlequin color. And in this design line, you, you don't know how many different colorways that they have, but all you know is for all the colorways, they're gonna, the stripes are gonna play out like this. And, but in this case, browns and purples and a little bit of greens are in this one. So Lang Yavel, you can see there's the, the pattern on there. You can see I have kind of this gray yarn. You can't really tell how the stripes are going to play out, um, but you can look at here and you can see, okay, the colors repeat before the actual full repeat completes. So you have the colors are alternating with thin stripes and then there's a big thick one of that color. Uh, and there's a thicker one of the darker ones. So you can kind of get an idea that there's a combination of, of thin stripes that, that occur for a while and then you have a solid stripe. So that gives you some indication when, when you're starting with the ball of yarn and you're pulling the yarn tail out. Uh, am, I, am I starting in a sequence where it's alternating with short stripes or do I have a big chunk of solid? Then this is another one of the Regia sock yarns. It's called Perfect. This one is uh, designed, this is an, again, a design line, but it's designed by Ar Arnie and Carlos. And for, for these yarns, these are yarns that are meant to be able to work. You can work these two at a time. You really need to work them cuffed down and you need to work with a short row heel because of the way the color sequence plays out. Um, there's sort of some limitations to how you can use this yarn, but it makes it possible to knit two at a time with no trouble. The challenge when you have a yarn like this, where you have these uh, varying widths of stripes and the colors may be repeating before the entire sequence has finished, is that when you're just pulling the yarn off and seeing the colors, if you see a color show up a second time, that doesn't necessarily mean that the a repeat has, has completed. It just means that the color's showing up again. So if you're trying to divide the yarn into 
uh, two equal size balls, you aren't necessarily or almost certainly not going to be able to tell uh, if you are at the same point in the colorway. So if you don't care whether or not your socks match, then you can do two at a time with the self-striping yarn. If there's no photo on the ball of yarn, then what I would do is go on Ravelry and look up the particular yarn and also look up the colorway. The colorway is going to be printed on here somewhere and see if anyone has made any projects with this colorway, particularly socks, so that you can see how the stripes play out. If sometimes when it's a new colorway, a brand new one, then there aren't any pictures on Ravelry yet and you might have to Google you have to Google the name of the yarn company and the name of the, the particular type of yarn that this is, and then also include the color number. And then sometimes you can get a picture that's produced by the yarn company. It's like a little poster and it has um, pictures of all the different colorways for that particular line. So like with the online where you can see all of these on here, it might be a poster something like that but maybe more like this where you'll see six or eight different socks that look like that that will show how the colorway plays out but you can see here this is a very simple striping pattern it's uh, red dark gray light gray red dark gray light gray so knowing that when i'm winding off yarn at the beginning i can tell uh, that okay when i get to the i know it's going to be a stripe about that big all the stripes are going to be about this big the dark gray is a little bigger and the light gray is a little thinner but they're going to be about that and so what you see right before this red is this kind of gray this gray and it's kind of a mottled gray and what i did for these socks which is something i often do is I find the point where the color changes, where it changed from gray to red. And at that turning point is where I begin, I do a long tail cast on. And so I, with the tail, I had the gray and that produced the, the actual edge. And all over my index finger was the red and that produced the stitches on the needle. And then after I finished the cast on, I just continued with the red and I got a full stripe. So sometimes that can work really well, especially when you have a wide stripe uh, to start with, just use that color changing place and then you'll have a little bit of a contrast um, at the edge. This is a colorway where if you've seen a picture and you know what it is, you probably could divide this ball of yarn into two and, have, and be confident that you're starting them at the same place because this is a very, very simple repeat. This, on the other hand, is probably the, mo the longest re color repeat I have ever worked with. Typically, the longest repeats are going to finish by the time I get to the ankle. This one did not. This one was a very wide orange stripe and you you probably can't see it up here, but this kind of reddish color is what I used at the cast on. So I, I started with this wide stripe of orange. Then I had a bunch of very narrow stripes, a wide of purple, a little speckled, yellow. I thought, me, I thought that this is the repeat uh, uh, finishing, but then I had uh, and I had this after it, but then I had, I didn't have purple. I had this red color and then I began working the heel. I'm still seeing colors I hadn't seen before. It wasn't until I turned the heel that this color, that this pattern began to repeat. And so this orange stripe right here is the same as this one. So sometimes it takes a really long time to even see how this plays out. There's no way when I was winding yarn off that I would have been able to accurately predict um, where the repeat was ending. Some people worry about interrupting the color sequence along the instep when you stop in order to work the heel because you're working the heel over half the stitches and you're working them uh, flat back and forth. You're working them in a different way than you've been working all of the stitches in the round up to this point. In this case, I don't know that you, I mean, you can see the purple and the yellow, but otherwise it, it's not obvious that this color repeat got interrupted like this part is never seen except right here at the heel and then just starting here at the toe this was one where there was no picture on the label it was new it was not on Ravelry and so I had to find I had to google and find it and what I saw was that you know I had these colors right here and I could see that the the blue was was there were thinner stripes and a dark medium light and then this um, black and white thing and then it reverse light medium dark again you get the black and white and then 
what you had was the beige, thinner, thin stripes of beige that were similar to the blue, but then you get a wide tan color. And that was where my ball of yarn was starting. And I could see from the photo that, you know, how long it was going to take to get through this whole repeat. It was going to take you know, the entire leg basically to get through it. And so for this one, I wanted to kind of plan ahead for what I was going to do. I made a peasant heel for this sock. So what I decided to do, I had so much of this dark brown. I didn't want to start with just a narrow uh, beige stripe. Um, and I didn't want to keep winding off until I got down to here. And because I also knew then that was going to place if I, if I started later, then that was going to move this up here in a weird way. And so I wanted this kind of beige uh, brown thing to be at the heel, I decided, since it was the kind of the largest central part of the design. So I had all this brown and I didn't know, I, I wasn't, there wasn't a color change at the beginning. There wasn't a little bit of the beige at the beginning for me to tell that I had all of the yarn for the stripe. So in order for me to make the second sock match this, I needed to measure off how much yarn I actually had here. And it was, it was a lot, it was like 10 yards or something. And so what I did was I found the color change here and then I measured back something like seven yards worth. I, and I made a note of it in my Ravelry notebook that I, that I started my cast on seven yards back from the color change. And that way my cast on edge, the long tail cast on would be made of both both strands would have this color and the stripe would be fairly wide. So I needed to know that so that when I started the second one that this stripe would be the same width as that one. So then the other thing I did was as I got to the leg because uh, my daughter is like me and has a very long uh, heel diagonal she needs a gusset for her peasant heels and short row heels. So when I was finishing this black and white stripe and I was working this beige, this, this beige stripe here, I started the gusset, I started doing increases. And then I placed my waist yarn for the heel because you don't knit a peasant heel at the time, you knit it later. So I placed my waist yarn and then I just continued on uh, with the colorway. So the colorway is uninterrupted along the top of the instep. And then I wound off yarn until I got to the beige stripe again. I joined it there and I, and I knit, the peasant heel is knit in the round. So I had the beige stripe and then I finished with the dark right here. And so on the back of the leg, this stripe is a little wider because it extends into the, to the heel. I don't know that this is the best or most ideal solution, but it is one that I, could kind of plan for uh, ahead of time, knowing that this striping sequence was kind of unusual. This is a pair of socks I just knit this week for my friend, Becky, who is having a surprise birthday party tomorrow. This was a yarn, and it's actually the same colorway as, as this one that I showed you earlier. I bought it two separate times because I liked it. So uh, what I did for this one, I didn't know how the colors were gonna play out, how often they were going to repeat, and, and so when I pulled the yarn out of the ball, I had some brown and it only, it was only a couple of yards worth of brown. There was a, there was a different color right before the brown. You can see that right here, I have, there's a little bit of this kind of teal color and then you have the color change to the brown. So I wound off the brown and I saw it was only a couple of yards. And so that therefore it was going to be a fairly short stripe. And because I had all of the yarn for this, for, for that particular color and it wasn't very long, I folded it in half and that's where I started the cast on so that the cast on is completely in brown. And then there's, you know, some, some tail to wind in. There's a few inches um, at the end that I need to weave in, but then I could do the same thing for the second sock. What I learned when I did this first sock was the, oh, there's a brown stripe. There are three brown stripes. And then and then there's some other stuff going on, but then when the, the next brown stripe starts, this is, so this is the whole repeat. So I knew that there's, once I got through this, I could see that there were three brown stripes within the full repeat. And that way, when I got to the end, I could see oh, I've got one brown stripe and then I'm finishing with a second brown stripe. So I had to wind off 
um, not only the third brown stripe, but I had to wind off all yarn that looked like this all the way down uh, to here. Uh, and then I could start my second sock. So the three options are to start at a color change. So you don't know, this has got a little bit of purple at the edge. I didn't know how long that purple stripe would was supposed to be, um, but I used it as a color change in so that the I would get a full stripe of this red. For this one, I could see a full length of the brown because I had a little bit of the green before it, and it was only a couple of yards long or a couple of meters long so I could fold it in half and create that for the cast on edge so there's no contrast at the edge but I get the full width of that stripe and then for this one because it was so wide I wound off until I found the color changed measured how much yarn I had and made a note of that and about how far back um, from that color change I started the, the sock so that I could do the second one in the same way. I mentioned, I don't know if it was last week or the week before that I said that I was going to wait until the fall before I knit my next vintage sweater. So I have this kind of large ongoing project going on where I'm knitting a sweater from each decade of the 20th century. And I have some criteria for how I'm making that selection. Uh, I want I want something to be unusual about either the construction method or the process. Uh, I want there to be some kind of a challenge in the pattern that I have to work through. Uh, so I don't want to knit from a vintage pattern that has already been updated into modern knitting terms with modern yarns and graded for multiple sizes and all of that kind of thing. I want to do that myself. One of the things that I'm particularly interested in is seeing how short rows were used throughout the century, just kind of seeing the evolution of how they were used for shaping and what particular short row technique was used. So that's been really interesting for me. And I've been wanting to do this in decade order. So I did my Edwardian sweater, and then I did my World War I sweater, and then I was gonna do the 1920s sweaters. And I found quite a number of 1920s sweater, sweater patterns that I like, and I have in mind a particular style of sweater that was very popular in the 1920s that I really want to knit, and I just haven't quite found the perfect one yet. That particular sweater style is very long, so it's gonna be a, another long knit, and I really, didn't want to do that in the summertime. It's a lot of wool sitting on my lap. So what I decided to do is to skip to the 1930s for right now. And I I'd selected a pattern that I really liked. And it's a fairly short pattern, a uh, short bodied uh, sweater pattern. And it's knit with a thicker yarn. And so it's, I think it's gonna go pretty quickly. So I, a couple of weeks ago, I ordered yarn for it and it came in and I've just been dying to get started on it. So what I wanna show you now is how I get started on a vintage pattern. Like what are the things I'm looking for when I'm reading through the pattern and, and, and determining how I'm going to do this. So like all of the vintage patterns I've knit so far, this one comes in one size. And previously the size that it came in was fine, it fit for me, this one is smaller. So this one I'm gonna to have to make adjustments in the size in order for it to fit me. I just wanted to show you how I approach um, getting started on a vintage pattern. It's called a popular model. It is uh, from a leaflet put out by the William uh, Briggs company and I, I'm i guessing that is a company that later became Briggs and Little. That's, that's my guess. It's a UK pattern and it's not American. And so I thought I'd show you sort of the approach I take with in some respects any new pattern I'm going to knit but especially with vintage patterns some things that I have to do that I wouldn't necessarily have to do with a contemporary pattern. So what you can see here is that this is not a terribly difficult looking sweater to knit. It's, it's pretty much stocking out with some garter ridges. And then it has this kind of interesting yoke up here that is basically knit one, purl one ribbing, and then there's 
some decreases and then so it's sort of staggered knit one pro one ribbings so as the yoke decreases then the knit one pro one ribs kind of stagger from each other but what's interesting about this sweater that caught my eye was that the yoke is confined to from the shoulders and scoops down it does not come down to the underarm and then go all the way up the way you normally see yoke sweaters. So it's a yoke sweater with set in sleeves and I really prefer a set in sleeve. So that was one thing that was interesting. The stitch pattern wasn't particularly daunting or there was nothing super interesting about that. So I was intrigued by the yoke pattern, but then as I read through the instructions and saw how the bodice was formed from the the underarm up to the shoulder this part here that maintains the pattern in the body that was something i'd never seen the way that that is constructed and that's what convinced me to knit this sweater so the first thing i do with any pattern is i look at the the materials and tools that are required i look at the gauge i look at, to see if there's a schematic these vintage patterns did not have schematics and i look at sizing so with a vintage pattern, typically it's going to call for a yarn that is no longer available. And so you have to try to figure out what it might be. Now this one is wool. It, it tells me the number of ounces. It doesn't give me any information about yardage. But when I look down here, I do see that there's a gauge. It says four stitches to the inch. That's an Aran weight yarn. So it's heavier than a worsted weight yarn, which would normally be knit at five stitches an inch. Um, but it's finer than a bulky weight, which is usually about three and a half stitches per inch. So it's in that in-between range. And this is not really that common a yarn weight to find in the United States. So that was, uh, that was one of my considerations. Would I be able to find the yarn that would work with this? Uh, or would I need to make an adjustment for gauge? Well, then we can look at the size. It says bust 32, 34 inches. My guess is that this is to fit a size 32 or 34, uh, which would mean uh, that I need to, to alter it to fit me. Um, but even if it's a finished measurement of 32 to 34, I still am going to want to adjust it. So I don't know at this point, I'm guessing that this is a, a to fit size. And, and I don't know yet how big the sweater actually is. So we have to figure that out by looking at the pattern and the stitch count and, and then dividing by gauge to kind of get a sense of how big the sweater is. The other thing I'm looking at with the material, so I know that the yarn is an Aran weight, figured that out. Uh, I look at the needle sizes. This is one pair, number two needles, and then one pair, number six needles. These are not US needle sizes. These are not metric sizes. These are UK, the old UK sizes. And the difference between UK needle sizes and the US sizes is uh, that they go in reverse order. So the UK size seven and the US size seven are the same size. But then as the US needles get bigger and the numbers get bigger, the UK needle size gets smaller. So a US eight is a UK six. So it, it, that means that this smaller needle number is actually the bigger of these two needles. So this works out, this number two is a seven millimeter needle and the number six is like a, a US eight, which is what, a five millimeter. So these are five and seven millimeter needles. A uh, US equivalent of a seven millimeter would be a 10 and three quarters, which some companies produce, uh, but, but they're not a standard US size. I happen to know that to get four stitches an inch, I am not going to need a needle that big. I'm going to probably need a size 10. Uh, because I would get three and a half stitches on a ten and a half. So I'm assuming I need something smaller than that. So I'm, my guess is that when I find the correct yarn, I'll probably need a ten and I will certainly swatch to see. So these are all things that I have to work out and I have some questions to answer, like how big is, the, what is the finished measurement of this? Uh, I don't know anything about row gauge here and I don't know if that's important. I can see here the length from the back of the neck is 17 inches. 
and the sleeve seam is 19 inches. So these are things that I will look at to see if these are, if this is the right size for me. I, I'm a little taller than average and my torso is certainly longer. So I will probably want my sweater to be an inch or two longer than this, probably. So I'm just gonna go through these, these instructions and I'm going to build a schematic. What I usually do is draw it out for a while and then when I get to the point where I wanna do some shaping, particularly if the shaping is unusual or I can't visualize it, then I will actually get my charting software out and kind of see what's going on. As all sweaters, this is a sweater that's knit in pieces and then seamed although the yoke is all knit in one piece. The back, it says to cast on 64 stitches with the smaller needles and to knit 20 rows of Knit One Pro One ribbing. So 64 stitches, and because I'm working at four stitches per inch, I know that that is going to be a 16 inch back. So this is my Knit One Pro One ribbing and it says to do this for 20 rows. I don't know how long 20 rows is with a gauge of four stitches per inch, I'm going to guess it's probably about six rows per inch. So this is probably a little more than three inches, but I really don't know yet. I won't know until I've kind of mapped everything out. So the next thing that we go to is that we establish the stitch pattern for the body. We're not changing stitch counts here at all. And the way this stitch pattern is set up is you work in stockinette for seven rows and then at the beginning of a wrong side row, row number eight is a wrong side row, you're going to knit across, which means it's gonna show up as a pearl, a pearl row on the right side. So that is the stitch pattern repeat. It's eight row repeat, that's row number eight. And they want this done five full repeats. They're not saying knit it to a certain number of inches, so this is where I know that they're expecting I'm gonna be working at a certain gauge because first of all, they're gonna expect that I'm using their yarn. And when you work with their yarn, if you get four stitches an inch, you're probably gonna get whatever their row gauge is. Row gauges vary from yarn to yarn. Uh, even if they're the same yarn weight, they can vary, the row gauge can vary. So they want five repeats of this. So one, two, three, four, five. They want the body to go up five repeats. So this was 20 rows. This is a, each one of these repeats is eight rows. So I know that this is row 60 altogether because I got 40 rows of this. Eight times five is 40 plus the 20. So this is row 60. And then it's when they start doing the shaping and they want me to bind off eight stitches and then knit all the way across. And then they want me to bind off eight stitches. That's two inches worth of stitches that they're having me bind off, knit all the way across. And then this is when the shaping begins for the bodice. And the instructions are quite different than anything that I've seen before. And so this is when I went into the charting. So if you look at the actual picture of the pattern, you can see that that the front you know curves this way it gets narrower and narrower all the way up to the shoulder and and um, so we've got some little bit of bind off here that's typical for an underarm and then that's going to go pretty much straight up so this shaping here normally you would assume that what's happening is that there are decreases worked uh, near the the yoke edge every right side row or something in order to get that shaping but that isn't what they end up doing so here I, I got out my charting software and I charted out the ribbing and I charted out the stitch pattern up to five and then I've got my bind offs. Then what happens is something a little different. After you've worked a bind off in each row, then you begin working this bodice shaping. So this is, this is uh, nothing you'd normally see in a chart. This is something that's for myself. So the first row that they have you work is a knit two together and then they have you knit a certain number of stitches and then they have you turn. So all of these little light shaded stitches are staying on the needle but they're not being worked. So we're working short rows here. We're not working decreases, we're working short rows. So you, they have you turn and they have you slip a stitch. You don't do a wrap and turn, you don't do a German short row, you don't do a shadow wrap, you don't do any of those. You turn and you slip that stitch and then you knit all the way back. 
and then there's one more uh, knit two together at this edge because this is all forming that underarm curve here and then you come all the way back to one stitch before where you had turned the previous time you stop another stitch earlier that's why i have this shaded box here to, to show that aside from the next stitches now i'm, st I'm stopping one stitch short every time so instead of um, this many stitches now i've got this many stitches plus this one so i slip and i go back and i knit across i stop one stitch short again turn and i slip and i'm still maintaining my my pattern with the garter ridge on it and i keep doing that one stitch fewer every time one stitch fewer every time and i'm maintaining that pattern until i turn and i step i've only got two stitches left this is all i've got left so all of these so what i've got here is then i've got all of these stitches that are also still still on the needle that haven't been worked as i've been doing these uh, shorter and shorter short rows they're all still on the needle and they're actually if you you'll be seeing this in the coming weeks but so if if you laid all these stitches out on a needle and you let the needle come this way there'd be stitches along the needle here and this fabric would all have you've gotten all this length right here that's what short rows do, does short rows add length to some of the stitches and not to the ones that are that are left there is one slipped selvage stitch for every two rows along this edge and if I were just to knit across those, which is a lot of times what you do with the short rows, when you're done with the short rows, you just knit across all of, all of the stitches that have been waiting there. This would end up far too short for all of this length. So instead, we've got these elongated slip stitches that are at the edge. As you work across them, right before every slip selvage stitch, you lift the running thread and you work it like a make one. You work it so that it twists. So you just lift it, work it till it twists. So you're adding, so you, as you're working across these selvage stitches, you're adding stitches all the way across. And you'll, you'll just keep adding and adding all the way down. And then you're gonna work across this way. And then you will do the reverse shaping that you did here on this other side. So this is the reason that I am knitting this sweater is because this is something I've never seen before. And I think it's a fantastic technique and i want to learn more about how to use that uh, strategy for short rows because I, I just think it's amazing aaron wit yarn a yarn that will knit up at four stitches per inch it's not something i commonly see so i actually ended up buying a sport weight yarn also not <laughs> super common and super easy to find but I, I bought a sport weight yarn and i doubled it and i want to show you why this works and how I figured out it would work. So there's a formula. If you have a, if you have two thin yarns, they could be the same or they could be different. You add the two gauges of the of the yarns together, and then you divide by three, and that will give you the gauge of the bulkier yarn. So if you're using two strands of the same yarn, you just double it. So if I have a sport weight yarn that is six stitches per inch. That's how, what it's supposed to knit up at. I multiply that by two and I get 12. Then I divide 12 by three and I get four stitches per inch. So if I use two strands of a yarn that, that knits up at six stitches per inch, I can double that and I can get a yarn that knits up at four stitches per inch. I have to use the needle that's appropriate for that gauge, but it, this is an approximate thing that, that um, can work. Um, so I actually went in the reverse order to figure out what gauge I needed. So I knew I needed four stitches per inch and instead of, and I go in the reverse order. So instead of dividing by three, I multiply by three to get 12. And then I can divide that by two to get six. So this is the, the gauge of the thinner yarn that I need uh, in order to get um, my four stitches per inch yarn. This is a closed fitting sweater, so I'm not gonna be wearing much of anything underneath it. So I, will, I chose a superwash. Well, last week I, I mentioned that I don't normally knit with superwash for sweaters unless I have a reason to. And this would be a reason is that I'm gonna, something that's gonna be worn right next to my skin. And so I want it to be very soft and not itchy at all.
So I bought it, I, I uh, swatched out on a size 10 needle, which is what I thought would probably I would probably need. And I did get four stitches per inch. Then I checked my row gauge. So one of the things I figured out with this, uh, with the sweater when I mapped it all out with all of the shaping and everything was that it was going to end up 95 rows long. Because remember, they didn't say knit to this many inches, knit to that many. They were telling me specifically how many repeats um, to work and exactly how to work certain rows. So I had 95 rows uh, and, and they, the pattern told me that the length of it was 17 inches. So that's 5.8 rows per inch. So that's very close to the six rows per inch that I would have expected a yarn worked at four stitches per inch to, to have. That's the row gauge I would have expected. But mine is only five rows per inch. And I don't know why. I'm not sure if it has to do with uh, doubling the yarn and if that um, because using two strands doesn't work quite the same as if all of those strands were plied together. I'm not sure if that's the reason or if the row gauge of the sport weight yarn as a single uh, strand has a, a different row gauge than I would have expected. I need to go to look at that again. But, but I do know that I want my sweater to be longer. It's going to end up with a, a sweater that's 19 inches because 95 rows divided by five rows per inch is 19 inches. So this is this will give me the, the measurement that I want. So I think I can just work the length of the pattern the way it says and what I'll have to, uh, to alter is how wide the pattern is. That's going to affect the yoke and it's going to possibly affect that that bodice shaping at the front I don't really I don't really know yet how I'm going to adjust for that. So this question showed up in the discussion of the sock knit along but it really pertains to more than just the knit along and it pertains to more than just sock knitting and the question came from somebody who was struggling to figure out she was trying to figure out what gauge and needles that she was going to need um, to knit her socks and she was very confused by this by the label that that she was looking at and it turns out that the yarn is a German yarn now many European yarn labels have very little language on it that you have to read. Most of it is in symbols and numbers, but you have to understand what those symbols are in order to interpret the instructions. So that's what I want to show you next is how to look at these yarn labels and determine the information that you need to knit something at the correct gauge. So this is Lang Yawol. Um, one of the things I like about Lang is they have this QR code and you can see where your yarn came from, which is kind of fun. I did that uh, last time I knit with this yarn. Uh, but what you'll see on the yarn label is information about uh, how to use this yarn. So there is a ton of information on this label that is just presented in symbols and numbers. First of all, this square represents a gauge square and gauge is typically presented as a number of stitches and a number of rows over four inches or 10 centimeters. So this represents a 10 centimeter square or four inch square. And in that size of that amount of knitting, you would have 30 stitches across and 41 row, rows. And the needle that you would typically need to get that gauge would be somewhere between a two and a half or three and a half millimeter needle. This, these are not US needle sizes, these are millimeter sizes sizes instead. Then you have some washing instructions. I'll put a link to a website that helps you understand these symbols. But once you are looking at them and you get familiar with them, you can get used to them. So this is the washing temperature that's in centigrade. That's 40 degrees centigrade. It's like 104, five degrees or something Fahrenheit. So it's warm wash. So you can machine wash warm. If it was hand wash only, there'd be a little hand going down inside it that you would see in there. The triangle with the X means no bleach. Um, this means you can machine dry it. And I think there's one dot in the middle, which means low temperature. The iron, you can iron it again, low temperature, because there's one dot. And this P has to do with dry cleaning. I don't remember, but I don't see any reason why you'd need to dry clean your socks uh, anyway. So 
but if you're interested, you could look up which dry cleaning solvent that one represents. The other information you see here is that to make a sweater for a man, you'd need about 500 grams of this yarn. For a woman's sweater, about 450. For a, a 10 year old kid, about 300. 100 grams ought to make a pair of socks that fits somebody with, with that shoe size, probably, especially at the high end, uh, high size end, it can be a little iffy. You have to be, you know, pretty careful. So this is the yarn that I'm using for my socks. It's from West Yorkshire Spinner. So it's a British yarn and it has similar information. It's presented similarly. Again, you see that the tension square and it says tension, but it writes it out tension, 10 centimeters or four inches square. And you'd have 28 stitches over 36 rows. And again, here's the needle size that you would probably need in order to get that. And of course, always when you're trying to achieve a gauge, you change your needle size. You don't stick with the needle size and then just live with the gauge. You, you go for the gauge you need and you change your needle size. Again, you've got, um, this one says 30 degrees Celsius. So a little bit more lukewarm uh, than regular warm. This says no dryer, uh, no bleach, again, a low temperature, uh, iron if you for some reason needed to iron your socks. I don't know why you would but in case you do. This is uh, another German yarn. Uh, I use this one a lot. Again, you see the tension square 30 stitches. M is the German, Masha is the German word for stitch. So 30 stitches, is, the 30 M means 30 stitches and then the 42 rows again over 10 centimeters, the needle size and they actually give you the US equivalents. Um, but the needle size that you're likely want to use and they even include a little crochet hook. So uh, this symbol means you can use this for machine knitting. And this is information about sweaters like we saw before, where you can knit a sock up to a uh, size 46, European size 46, using 100 grams of this, or you'd need about 500 grams for a sweater. I don't know what the European 40 means. I don't know how big a sweater size that is. And again, you've got um, 40 degrees Celsius wash, no bleach, low dryer, low iron, and then whatever that P is for that type of dry cleaning. So here's an American yarn, sock yarn, Barocco. So let's look at this label. Let's look around here. So, oh, we can see the square again. Uh, this one tells us uh, 30 stitches and 40 rows over the four, the four inches or 10 centimeters, but they also to break it down into just 7.5 stitches per inch. This gauge is the gauge that you want if you are knitting a sweater. This is marketed as sock yarn, but that is the gauge that you would want for a sweater. You want firmer gauge than that for a sock. You want eight and a half stitches, nine stitches per inch um, when you are knitting socks, which means you'll need an even smaller needle probably than this one because this is the needle size you'll probably need to use, the average person would need to use to get this gauge. Um, so you will need a smaller needle in order to get a firmer gauge than that. This is another European yarn. Again, you can see uh, they present a little bit differently. You'll see here it says 2 comma 5 to 3 comma 0. If you're not familiar in Europe, they the decimal point is a comma. It, they just do things differently than we do. So that means 2.5 to 3.0 millimeter needles to get, again, seven, um, 30 stitches and 42 rows over 10 centimeters or four inches. So let's look at another American yarn. Now this is more typical of an American yarn. They just spell out the gauge. They don't have a little square or anything. They just spell it out. Um, this is six to seven stitches an inch. So 24 to 28 stitches over four inches. And then the size needle you'd need to get uh, something in that gate. And again, you want to go firmer than this for socks. This is some Madeline Tosh. And you can see here, they do have these, these international symbols. They tell you that's fingering weight and they're telling you if you want to knit it, here's the gauge. They're not using the little square like you see in the European yarns. So this is Neighborhood Fiber Company. This is an independent dyer. She's out of Baltimore, I believe. I really like her yarn. So she is much briefer on here. It just says the fiber content, how many yards, and then seven to eight stitches per inch with a US one to two. 
Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you're interested in the August Sock Knit Along, again, there's a link down in the video description to the Ravelry pattern page where you can purchase it. And my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks, is where you can ask questions or chat with other people who are going through the knit along. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.